Thank you for inviting the Federal Trade Commission to participate in the Department of Justice's Elder Justice Initiative Federal Webinar Series. My name is Lisa Schifferly, and I'm an attorney in the FTC's Division of Consumer and Business Education. This webinar will discuss scams and identity theft affecting older adults. Whether you're an older adult yourself or someone who works with older adults, we'll have tips for you. The webinar will be divided into two parts. First, we'll discuss scams, looking at the latest trends, tips, and tools. We'll focus on the FTC's Pass It On campaign, which is designed to get older adults talking about scams. Pass It On gets you sharing what you know to prevent people who you know from scams. For those working with older adults, Pass It On is a great tool to use at scam jams or presentations in the community. In the second part, we'll discuss identity theft trends, tips, and tools, focusing on identitytheft.gov, the federal government's one-stop resource to report identity theft and get detailed advice to help you fix problems caused by identity theft. Let's start with scams. What trends are we seeing? The FTC's 2016 complaint data shows that imposter scams are the second largest complaint, followed by identity theft as the third largest. This presentation will focus on those two areas, imposter scams and identity theft. When it comes to scams, how are scammers contacting consumers? As you'll see on these pie charts, the vast majority of scammers are contacting people by phone, 77% in 2016. That's followed by 8% who contacted by email and 6% who contacted by internet. While we're all rightfully worried about online scams, it's important to recognize that most of these scams are happening by phone. If you are in law enforcement or advocacy for older adults, knowing that most of these scams occur by phone can be helpful to tailoring your outreach and response. Now let's look at what trends we're seeing in terms of how scammers are asking people to pay. Most scammers still request wire transfer, 58% in 2016. The number of complaints where scammers requested prepaid cards has dropped significantly from 35% in 2014 to 7% in 2016. Why does this matter? Requesting money by wire transfer can be a red flag of a scam. If you send money by wire, it's almost impossible to get the money back. Please share this with older adults that you know and work with. While we're talking about trends, let's look at consumers' age. A lot of people wonder whether older adults are more likely to be victims of scams. The FTC's complaint data suggests that older adults are not more likely to report being victims of scams. These pie charts show scam complaints to be fairly evenly distributed by age category. So looking at all the trends, we see that scammers mainly use the phone, request wire transfer, and target all age groups. Knowing these trends is the first step towards avoiding imposter scams and helping the older adults you serve avoid them. So now that we've discussed scam trends, let's move on to tips about imposter scams. To avoid imposter scams, it's important to talk about how they work. Here are some hallmarks of imposter scams. Con artists pretend to be from the government or a well-known business or a trusted friend or relative. They claim you need to pay money or provide personal information. They describe dire circumstances and they ask for payment by wire transfer or prepaid card. What can you do to avoid imposter scams and help older adults you know avoid them too? First tip to share, stop and check it out. Don't give personal information unless you're sure who you're talking to. How do you know? If someone calls you, you can't be sure who you're talking to. They can spoof caller ID to look like they're someone that they're not. Before providing any information, call back at a number you know to be correct, not a number that the caller gave you. Here's another tip to share. To reduce unwanted calls, sign up for the Do Not Call registry at donotcall.gov. You can also sign up to block robocalls at nomorobo.com. We've talked about imposter scams generally. Now let's look at a few specific types of imposter scams that we're seeing a lot of lately. IRS imposter scams, tech support scams, grandkid or family emergency scams, and online dating imposters. First, IRS imposters. What do these IRS imposter calls sound like? 
Someone says they're from the IRS and you owe money for back taxes. They threaten to sue you or maybe even arrest or deport you. They may rig caller ID to make it look like they're calling from the IRS in DC. Then they'll demand immediate payment, usually through wire transfer or prepaid card. Sometimes they'll even direct people to where they can get the money cards and stay on the phone with them until they go buy them. How can we recognize these IRS imposter scams? Here are a few things to keep in mind. The IRS will never ask you to pay with prepaid debit cards or wire transfers. The IRS will not ask for credit card information over the phone. The IRS will not threaten arrest or deportation. And the IRS will not initiate contact by email. Their first attempt at contact is usually by U.S. mail. So if you get a call asking you to pay by wire or prepaid card for an IRS debt, stop. Don't pay. It's a scam. These are the tips to share with others so they can avoid these scams too. How can you tell if it's an imposter or the real IRS? Maybe you're working with someone who thinks they really do owe back taxes. If you or they have any doubts about whether taxes are owed, call the IRS directly at 800-829-1040. Now let's talk about another popular scam these days, tech support scams. How do these tech support scams work? You've probably heard about them. Scammers call saying they're from a reputable company and that they've noticed viruses on your computer and need to remote in. Sometimes scammers place online ads, so when you do a search for computer help, you get their phone number or website. They may ask you to give them control of your computer, then they steal your information. Or they may show you things on your computer that they say are viruses, but really they aren't. Then they get you to pay for tech support services that you really didn't need or that are worthless. We've seen this scam affect many older Americans. So what are tips to avoid these scams? Please pass along these tips to the older adults you know or work with. Just hang up. Never give control of your computer to someone who calls you out of the blue. Don't pay them for tech support services either. Also, be cautious when looking up tech support online because phony companies advertise online too. Check the BBB or state attorney general for scam complaints against a company before using it. And take this knowledge and pass it on to others in your community. Now let's turn to a different type of scam, grandkid scams, or we could also call these family emergency scams. In these scams, someone calls pretending to be a family member. For older people, this scam often involves someone calling claiming to be a grandchild. The grandchild said she's in trouble. Maybe she needs help with a medical bill, or maybe he says he's in jail in a foreign country. The grandchild says it's urgent. Keep it a secret. Don't tell mom and dad. Then the caller asks you to wire money or put it on a prepaid card for right away. What should you advise someone who gets a call like this? Stop. Don't send money. Call back your grandchild at a number you know is correct, or text or call another family member. They may be able to quickly confirm that your grandchild is not out of the country, but is actually at school taking their math test. Again, in the spirit of the FTC's Pass It On campaign, please pass on this information to others you know. The FTC has also heard from people about something called a romance scam, and it's an imposter scam of a different sort. With online dating scams, the imposter poses as someone else, usually on a dating website. Often the scammer tries to move quickly, professing love, moving off the dating site to regular email or phone calls, and quickly finding a reason for you to send him or her money. Those are all serious red flags of someone who's after your money, not you. The request for money might be for a ticket to visit you, maybe for surgery for the scammer or a supposed family member, or for some kind of legal or visa trouble. What can you tell someone who's caught up with these types of scams? Advise them to check it out. Ask them, what do you really know about this person? Encourage them to tell the person asking for money that sending money is beyond their reach. And when requests for other amounts of money come in, and they probably will, say that those are out of reach too. One approach is to say that it's your policy not to give or lend money. And please tell them, whatever you do, don't send money. Not wiring money, not getting a reloadable debit card, 
and not sending money in any other way. Now that we've covered scam related trends and tips, let's turn to tools. The main tool the FTC offers is Pass It On. Pass It On has consumer protection information for active older adults. The materials respect a lifetime of experience, are short and to the point, and encourage people to share, to share what they know. The topics covered include identity theft, imposter scams, charity fraud, healthcare scams, paying too much, in other words, reading your bills, and you've won scams. We also have a new set of materials focusing on the imposter scams that we covered today. These materials are great for older adults and for people who work with them. If I had to summarize the campaign quickly, it would be this. Pass it on reinforces what older adults know and gives more detail so they feel more confident sharing what they know. It recognizes that older adults are not vulnerable victims. Instead, they're part of the solution. What does Pass It On include? We heard that some groups like activities, so we put word games on the website, not easy ones either. We have a video that gives a look at the campaign and how easy it is to pass it on. There are 10 minute presentations for each topic for the person who's really into it and wants to go say to the Rotary and do a talk or for any professional who might wanna do something at a senior center. There's a sample press release for any group that wants to take this campaign as their own as well as tweets or Facebook posts, if you're social media inclined. We also have sample articles. This is non-copyrighted public domain material, so you can use it freely without requesting permission. Here's an example of a sample activity. We invite you to order the Pass It On materials at ftc.gov slash pass it on. Use them in your communities. Take what you know and pass it on. Now let's move to the second part of the presentation, identity theft trends, tips, and tools. First, a little background. According to the Department of Justice, 17.6 million people were identity theft victims in 2014. That represents 7% of the U.S. population. The FTC received over 370,000 complaints in 2017. When it comes to identity theft trends, these are the top five complaint categories. As you'll see from the graph, credit card is the largest type, followed by tax, bank, mobile phones, and utilities. This is based on the complaints the FTC received in 2017. Another interesting trend that you can't see on this chart, but we know from our data, is that new account identity theft is on the rise. For example, of the 38% credit card, 28% is new account rather than existing. So what are some tips to reduce the risk of identity theft? I like to say, protect what you have and be careful what you share. Protect what you have means to minimize the personal information you carry around with you, both in your wallet and on your phone. If you have a smartphone, then password protect it. And keep personal information locked securely. If an older adult has caregivers in the house, make sure that personal information is stored away in a secure place like jewelry. Be careful what you share goes back to what we were talking about with imposter scams. Don't give information unless you know who's asking and why. Another important tip is to monitor accounts closely. That means reviewing mail and financial statements. So, if you work with or know an older adult who has a pile of unopened mail at their front door, encourage them to open it, review it, and make sure there are no suspicious transactions on their accounts. It's also important to check your credit report, at least annually, at annualcreditreport.com. Finally, when you're done with personal information, dispose of it properly. Usually that means shred it. If you're planning a scam jam or other event at a senior center, consider making it a shredding event too. With tax identity theft being such a big problem, it's important to take special steps around tax time too. Know your tax preparer. AARP offers legitimate tax prep assistance for older adults at locations throughout the country. File returns as early in the tax season as possible. If you're filing by mail, take it directly to a post office. Scammers look for tax returns in outgoing mailboxes around tax time. If you're filing online, make sure you're using a secure network. 
Don't do it from a Wi-Fi hotspot like in many coffee shops or libraries. And if you become a victim of identity theft, here's a tool to know about, identitytheft.gov. Identitytheft.gov allows you to report identity theft and get a personal recovery plan that walks you through the steps to take to fix the damage caused by identity theft. This is the first screen you'll get when you go to identitytheft.gov. You'll see in the box in the upper right hand corner that the entire site is also available in Spanish. To report identity theft, you'd click on Get Started. I'll walk you through what you'll see if you report identity theft at identitytheft.gov. Next, you'll get a list of options describing your identity theft situation. This person is going to report tax identity theft. For identity theft victims, the website's information gathering process begins here. As you can see across the top, the website will go through six screens to collect details about the theft, the victim's information, any suspect information, and other details. The website explains that the information will be used to create an FTC identity theft report and an individual recovery plan for the victim. And thanks to recent enhancements, if you're reporting tax identity theft, the site will also complete the IRS identity theft affidavit for you. You can then send it directly to the IRS using identitytheft.gov. On the right, the website explains how people's information will be used. The information that people report to the FTC is integrated into the FTC's Consumer Sentinel Network, a secure database of consumer fraud complaints that is available solely to law enforcement for investigative purposes. After the website collects information about the identity theft, it produces an identity theft report, which is your official statement of what happened to you. Victims can use the identity theft report to exercise certain rights available to them under the Fair Credit Reporting Act. For example, they can use it to block identity theft related information on their credit report. Next, you'll be able to create an account which allows you to go back in the future to access sample letters and an interactive checklist of to-do steps. Then you'll get a recovery plan that walks you through the steps to take to recover from identity theft. For victims of tax-related identity theft, the system also will create this IRS Form 14039, the IRS Identity Theft Affidavit and pre-fill it with information the consumer has supplied. The consumer can then send the form directly to the IRS through identitytheft.gov. We hope you'll encourage anyone you know who's an identity theft victim to use identitytheft.gov to report the theft and get a personal recovery plan because recovering from identity theft is easier with a plan. In addition to identitytheft.gov, the FTC has a print version of an identity theft recovery guide. It includes forms and sample letters for a variety of identity theft situations. While we recognize that some people would be more comfortable using this print guide, we strongly encourage people to go to identitytheft.gov because then they can also report identity theft, get tailored advice for their particular situation, plus get an identity theft report to use to help recover from identity theft. If you're an advocate working with older adults and older identity theft victims, you can order copies of the print guide for your office. But please also encourage people to use identitytheft.gov. Advocates can even help someone file a report at identitytheft.gov. In addition to the Identity Theft Recovery Plan booklet, we also have a variety of other identity theft print materials, including ones about child identity theft, one for military personnel and families, and one on data breaches. You can order all of our materials for free, in bulk, in English and Spanish at ftc.gov slash bulk order or bulkorder.ftc.gov. Please order them and share them in your community. You can have them in your office, pass them out at senior centers, share them at libraries or community centers. They're all free. In addition to ordering publications, we hope you'll take what you learned in today's webinar and talk to others about preventing scams and identity theft against older adults pass it on. Thanks to the Department of Justice Elder Justice Initiative for inviting the FTC to be a part of this webinar series. And thanks to all of you for the work you do in the field of elder justice.